about yourself. I'm not reading a long paper. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for the organizers. My name is Asha Kari, and I'm coming from Sudan. And I'm an activist uh, in the area of women's rights. I spent all my life uh, working on that. <clears throat> I was in the academia for some time, and then I decided to be a practitioner. So I went into the deep waters. Um, I remember when I was 15 or 16, and I used to be a, a hungry reader, and me and my friend at that time. And we were also daydreamers. And we decided that each day we will share one dream. And one day I said I would like to be the Prime Minister of Sudan. <laughs> with, the, with, the, with, with the whole cabinet of women, you know. And she, my friends, she said, and a uh, book of Noana Sa'adawi was, uh, uh, we were ready, we reading uh, that book. She said, my dream today is to meet with Noana Sa'adawi. Two months after that, she was um, taken from school and she was forced into marriage, a red marriage. She was only 15. Um, I think my anger that day when I knew what happened to Awatif, her name was Awatif, and my feelings, when I go back to my life, I think that is when I decided to dedicate my life to um, end women oppression and women suppression. Millions of women um, in my country are like Awadi, who had dreams, who had hopes, who had the prayers, but they didn't have the chance to do it. I am so glad I continued. And I am glad to be with you here to share with you some of our experiences in Sudan. A country that has been in military, fundamentalism, dictatorship. The three sort of evils, if the word is right. Since 1989. And we were in the middle of the longest conflict in Africa at the same time. And that conflict was mainly because of the uneven bias development in Sudan. But in 89, it was converted into a religion conflict when jihad was introduced against the citizens of the same country in the name of Islam against the non-Muslims in the north, in the south. And that has completely transformed the whole uh, um, um, discourse of, of that conflict. With that, we were also uh, um, plagued by the introduction of uh, Sharia laws, which framed not only the family law, but all the laws in Sudan, the criminal laws and everything. The, the, when this government came into being, they came with a, what we call a Taliban-like regime, especially with regard to women. However, that uh, uh, project fell because the Sudanese women movement in Sudan historically was very strong. And maybe some of you here know about the history of the Sudanese women when we really um, stood up and gained so many of our rights since the 60s. However, a serious critique 
is uh, directed towards the Sudanese women movement is that they concentrated on the public sphere. They did not necessarily went into the private sphere. Apart from a little bit of work on the issue of FGM and probably the abandon of the obedience house, Beta Ta. Apart from that, they did not really uh, work on dismantling the power relation at the private sphere. And nobody was talking about violence against women, even during conflict in the South. It is not until the mid-1990s, after the population conference here in Cairo and the Beijing conference in 1995, that the Sudanese women started to a little bit talk about violence against women. And the first survey that was done in Sudan was in 2001. which revealed um, how much violence against women in Sudan was embedded in the family, within the community, basically cultural violence, but also the structural violence. <laughs> Something happened in 2003, which is a violence, uh, the conflict in Darfur. And I must salute the Darfurian women because they were very vocal about the sexual violence that happened to them during the war, and particularly the escalation and the systemic raping of women in Darfur. And the whole world have seen and listened to the um, um, collective sexual violence against women in Darfur. What people do not know until now is that, and now Darfur is not in the news anymore, and nobody is talking about what is happening in Darfur or in any other part of Sudan because we are in a so-called post-conflict uh, period. What is nobody is talking about and is this still happening is the normalization of sexual violence in Darfur and elsewhere. Rape and sexual violence is becoming a daily event in Sudan. Not confined to conflict affected area, but in big cities like Khartoum, in Madani, and all over the place. The systematization of violence, especially um, uh, um, uh, domestic violence, is enforced and reinforced by the laws in Sudan. And yesterday I talked about some of the articles in the family law which uh, legalize violence against women. And I mentioned, for example, the marriage of girls as of the age of 10 or the legalization of polygamy or the um, um, uh, inequality in inheritance and so on. And all those issues are perceived by women as violence against them. However, I am adding to this in the um, criminal act of Sudan, and particularly <coughs> Article 152, against which this woman was lashed in the streets, <coughs> says, whoever commits in a public place an act or conducts himself in an incident uh, manner or a manner contrary to public morality or wears an indecent or immoral dress which causes annoyance to public feelings 
shall be punished by whipping not exceeding 40 lashes or with fine or with both. This article is an article within the criminal law. And this article is supported by a state level law which is called the public order law. And maybe some of you have heard about the Lugna case a few months ago. Normally, women are taken from the streets allegedly because they are wearing clothes which are indecent. What is the definition of indecent? Nobody knows. It depends on how the person who is taking you to court defines indecency. Until now, and this law started, uh, uh, was in effect uh, since 1999, 1991, until today, not a single man was charged by wearing indecent clothes. <laughs> All women. <coughs> and it is not, it is by chance this woman was, um, um, a film was taken. But this is happening on an everyday basis in Sudan. Women are lashed continuously for um, uh, not uh, adhering with the public order. <laughs> if you are wearing a trouser like myself today, then you, are, you, are, you can be lashed. If you are going with your boyfriend or even with your brother, you can be lashed. If you are walking in the streets, just walking, having a walk, you know, you can easily be taken. No, 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 no trial, no lawyer. Immediately you will be taken to the court and immediately the judge will judge you and immediately you will be lashed. 7,000 women were um, taken by the public order law last year, 2009. So this is an institutionalized violence against, mainly against women. Although the, the law doesn't say that, but the practice and the institutions are, uh, this is what is happening. They, we are now having a big campaign, not because of the lashing which, happened, which we saw last week, but we are having a big campaign since two years now under the slogan, No for Women Oppression. We are trying to change, to abolish 152, Article 152 from the criminal law. But it is not only this article. There is another article, 149 of the Criminal Act, which defines rape as zina. It, it defines rape as zina. It says rape is a forced zina. Zina is adultery. Zina in Arabic is adultery. Adultery. So, and because we are under an Islamic uh, Sharia law, the punishment and uh, they call uh, the zina or adultery is one of the hudud, one of the um, punishable crimes in Islam. And by equating in the law rape by zina, this is um, uh, deferring women from reporting rape. And we have so many cases where women are raped and couldn't uh, um, prove that, you know, and they got pregnant and they are immediately, because they got pregnant, immediately punished as adulterers. <laughs> this is actually a big problem. And we are calling for, for 
for for for uh, the human rights defenders and for the human rights um, uh, offices to 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 listen to us, you know, because. Um, it is not enough that we are charged uh, by the Sharia laws, but we are mixing. <coughs> we are, we are um, um, ironically and in a very strange way, um, um, shifting uh, the, the woman from a victim to a perpetrator or to a criminal. You know? And in all the cases, when women are, are charged by zina or by adultery, there are no men to be punished. The men are not there at all. So you punish the woman because she got pregnant. And this, hap this is happening all the time. The, the, my point, which I would like to say here, is that the continuum of violence <coughs> is a reality that we are living on an everyday basis and the fact that we are now in a sort of like peace time is not helping because as soon as you sign a peace agreement, then all the attention that some issues you get during the conflict simply disappear. They simply are not there. And then the violence, as I said, normalized. It is sort of now even uh, legalized, and uh, uh, it is um, uh, reinforcing the power relation, of course, inside the family, inside in the community, and it is uh, um, uh, victimizing women. Women in most part of the country are so victimized to the extent that they are perpetrating violence themselves. They are caught in this cycle of violence and they are becoming part of it. And this is now something that is taken against us, you know, the activists. You know, you see women, they are, uh, for example, circumcising their girls, you know. They are um, um, agreeing on marrying their girls, you know. So what are you, they are, they are happy, they are doing it. The, 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 the element of victimization, people do not see that. And we know that you, uh, the, uh, as, a, as, as an oppressed person, you can internalize uh, the, 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 the same culture, you know, subconsciously. And then you become part of the problem. And that makes our role as activists difficult. So I have one minute to conclude what I would like to say and emphasize is that I personally appreciate the support of this conference. I just don't want whatever we are going to write is to confine to this incident. This is a one incident. What is happening is happening at, on an everyday basis. My own daughter was taken because she was wearing a trouser and she was having a walk with her cousin, you know, who is a female cousin. Uh, and she was taken to the security, you know. She was not lashed, but that's what is happening every, every day. So we, we need to call actually uh, for uh, lifting these uh, oppressive discriminatory laws. And for us, the feminists and the secularists in Sudan, we are even calling for lifting the whole Sharia laws. You know, because this is where the, the issue, uh, I mean, the, the Sharia laws is the, the, the reason for all that. They are reinforcing the already existing cultural practices and they are strengthening the continuum of violence in Sudan. Thank you so much. According to the situations I passed through, times I've experienced and women I've met. So the more I learn, the more I know about human rights, is the less I believe in them. <laughs> this is uh, oh, no. exactly what I would like to, to say. It's due to my long-term experience, especially in the last 20 years. This is mine, thank you. <laughs>
Um, this is my minutes. <laughs> I have only 10 minutes. Um, now, previous speakers spoke of tools of war. There is one tool of war that have never been, has never been mentioned, and it concerns me a lot, especially by women, it needs to be mentioned. We always, when we hear of war, we, we think of helicopter gunships, tanks, the pleasure and uh, the honor of, uh, to be one of the organizers of this conference. Uh, but of course, the main task was on Boriana, Azza, and uh, Lillian, and some others, <laughs> because I was in London. Uh, and uh, really happy to have contributed to a conference to uh, celebrate Nawal Saadawi and to honor her work, her life, and uh, her valuable writings and uh, existence among us in the Middle East and in the world. And I think, uh, you know, Nawal symbolizes women's liberation and uh, very inspiring revolutionary thoughts, uh, not only in the region, but uh, globally. I was uh, personally 17 years old when I was reading Nawal's books. And uh, Nawal has many supporters in Iraqi Kurdistan and Iraq itself. Just two weeks ago, one of her articles was published in Kurdish, actually. It was translated. So, um, you know, it doesn't matter where you are born, but what matters is what you say and how actually your work uh, symbolizes uh, the freedom and the liberation of women wherever they are. Because I think the scale and level of oppression and violence against women in its very different structures is relevant to all of us, uh, regardless of our borders and nations and all these identities that we are being subjected to. Uh, basically, I would like to de dedicate the first part of my speech, since I have the <laughs> opportunity to speak longer, I would like to dedicate the first part of my speech to the sufferings, but uh, as well as to the struggles of women both in Iraq and Iraqi Kurdistan. Um, I grew up in Iraq and from a very early age I started witnessing wars. Um, one war after another, I was only six when uh, Iran and Iraq war broke out, followed by the Gulf War and then sanctions and then uh, followed by the uprising in the Iraqi Kurdistan when I was 17 years old or 16 years old I think. And I have witnessed a lot of violence, and my family were heavily involved in political struggle against dictatorship. And um, that's one of the things that actually um, maybe I learned from them. It's a tradition in runs in the family to be politically active, not to actually uh, accept oppression and uh, to accept uh, uh, and uh, whatever disguise, it could be nationalistic oppression, it could be uh, you know, gender uh, discrimination, it could be anything. What is important is not actually to bend down, it's important to fight, no matter uh, what the fight is, uh, where and at what level it is. So I witnessed a lot of these wars. Uh, in addition to that, when we liberated Iraqi Kurdistan and we became under the mandate of the UN from 1991 in a very big popular uprising, I witnessed another war, this time a civil war between Kurdish political parties. I grew up under two different nationalisms. Arab nationalism uh, symbolized in the Ba'ath Party of Iraq uh, that actually indiscriminately killing people, executing them, imprisoning them. We had Abu Ghraib, the most notorious prison in Iraq that actually contained thousands and thousands of political prisoners from all over Iraq. And uh, <clears throat> my family were subjected to all kinds of violence and persecution from this regime. Uh, but that did not lead me to one day or one minute in my life to have hatred for Arab people or for any other people. When Saddam was about to be executed, I appeared on the media and I opposed his execution, not because I am not against him. I was, and my family fought against his regime because he was an oppressor to Arab people, to Christian people, to Shiites, to Kurds, to Sunnis as well. <laughs> if you did not collaborate with him, you are done with. You know, but particularly his violence was targeted against Kurdish people because he was trying to, uh, I think he was trying to bully people into the idea and belief that Arab were superior and that he is the Arab leader of the region 
on the expense of killing and slaughtering and uh, subjecting Kurdish people into genocides and mass graves and all sorts of other violence, rape of women, torture, you name it. This is the kind of oppression we did not uh, accept. I had to witness my own family going through all sorts of troubles, including my own brother to be killed in front of my eyes. But to this day, I don't really accept any nationalisms. Because under the Kurdish nationalism, I suffered another sort of uh, oppression. I suffered another sort of discrimination. This time, we are Kurdish. We have to preserve the honor. We have not to speak out against the oppression by the Kurdish rulers, the corrupt rulers. They just, a few months ago, they killed a young journalist. They kidnapped him, they killed him because he had the courage and the guts to criticize the most brutal Kurdish rulers in our region. For me, being Kurdish and Arab and Persian and this and that, I don't give a damn about any of these nationalisms. <laughs> what I care about is human rights, is equality between humans. Look at all of us. Who knows where you are from if you don't tell me what is your identity? Who knows who I am? I think so many people didn't know until today if I'm Kurdish or Arab or whatever. Someone said, are you from Nigeria? <laughs> Just this morning. You know, I could be like, for example, in London or in Europe when I talk, oh, are you from Iraq? Well, they, they think we are savages. They think I have to be veiled under burqa. You know, that's the, that's the stereotypical image of the Middle Eastern woman. That's why when I write about our suffering, I write about all suffering of women in the Middle East because of culture, because of tradition, because of religion, because of oppressive regimes that we are facing with. The violence against women is not simply a matter of tradition and culture. I'm sorry, that's too wrong. It's a matter of politics. It is a political oppression. What we suffer from here, it's because of our borders. What Palestinian people are suffering from, it's a Western creation of suffering, you know? What Kurdish people in Turkey are suffering from, it's because of the Turkish identity and Turkish state on the basis of slaughter of Armenians that nobody talk about and Kurdish people in Turkey itself. You name it. There are thousands of examples on this planet that we can go on and on and on. It's not only about me as a Kurdish person to come here and to be nostalgic about my background and history. I want to move on. I want to move on and put behind that past. I don't want to be stuck in the box of nationalism. Oh, me and this and we and... No, sorry, this is too wrong and this is too narrow-minded. I want to cut across borders, nationalities, religions, cultures, and traditions, and to actually put them in a dustbin and act like human beings only. Act like we are human beings. We have to be in solidarity with each other. We have to have sympathy with each other. I realize that so much brutality that we have been you know, subjected to, that we have been desensitized even of showing simple solidarity with each other when we are in trouble. How can I not, you know, f fall in tears when I see a woman in Afghanistan is lashed? How can I not fall in tears if I see a woman is being stoned or executed in Iran or someone is being beheaded in Saudi Arabia or somebody, somebody's hands is being chopped off in Saudi Arabia each week for stealing? And you have the powerful rich who, when they try to eat, just one plate is as big as this whole room, as if they can never have enough of food. You know, but they cut off someone's hands because he's a thief. This is hypocrisy. This is hypocrisy, I call it. I am in solidarity with Saudi Arabian women who are getting stoned to death for so-called adultery. Oh, I salute them for adultery. Adultery is a very good thing, in my opinion. I really think that being in illicit relationship is the best. You know why? Because our men, they want us pure, virgin, untouched. Oh, I'm sorry, I want to be touched by whoever I like, regardless if the men like it or not. It's my right, it's my body, okay? 
so this is all these notions of preserving honor and this whole bullshit about honor, about nation's honor, tribe's honor, society's honor. I just don't give a damn about it really. I had enough of it, I'm sick of it, because it's the basis of keeping us as slaves labeled for a man. When I see a woman under burqa, I'm sorry, that's not a matter of choice. I have written that, my article is in The Guardian. Veil and burqa is not a matter of choice. It is actually imposed on you in one way or another, either under social pressure, religious pressure, family pressure, male pressure. Why do I have to cover myself in order not to arouse men? Oh, I'm sorry, they have to keep themselves low. We know, I don't get aroused when I see a man, <laughs> any man. Why do they have to be? They keep us as sexual beings, sexual beings only, women and men. Well, actually, women likes each other as well. There are lesbians, there are gay people, you know. So the whole notion of these gender stereotypes are changing, and we have to admit to those changes. The only, another problem in the Middle East is actually the denial that we are in and the nostalgic that we have about our past and legacies and you name it. I think we have to overcome all of that. We have to be acceptance and open-minded of the changing of the world around us, of the changes that, it, that are taking place. You know, I am here among all of you from all different nationalities. I absolutely have no feeling that I'm strange to anyone. No, it's my home here. You know, why should I feel like uh, I am in a, uh, I don't know, wonderland or something like that? You know, the, the problem, I am sorry, it was just a little bit of <laughs> introduction to why I am here today, why I am a political activist, why? I think I have gone through so much in my life that actually taught me much more than 200 books can teach me, you know? Because I think we need to learn from those experiences, from those difficulties that we have gone through. In Iraq and Iraqi Kurdistan, I think it's difficult to find a family where they don't have someone killed, where they don't have someone executed or raped or you name it. Now we have been, Iraq has been subjected to military occupation. I was actually the first to start campaigning in UK from prior to the occupation, start to campaign against America's invasion of Iraq because most of the sufferings of the people in the Middle East is because American intervention. As a state, I have many good relations with American people on people level, but I have absolutely no doubt about the agenda of America, UK and their allies, their agenda in the Middle East to keep people oppressed, to keep us back, backward, and to keep us in ignorance, and basically to rule us. Look what they have subjected Iraq to. Absolute disaster. I was in Baghdad in September, because my organization is based in Baghdad, and we are functioning there. We have shelters, we have radio, we have newspaper, we help women, we support them. This report is about prostitution and trafficking in Iraq. It's outside, feel free to take one copy. No one even speak about prostitution and trafficking in Iraq. It's a taboo, even among the women organizations, even, even among women. As I said, we are desensitized from, being, from having simpler solidarity with women as well. So, I'm sorry, I think sometimes we have to stop and think, what are we talking about here? You know, what kind of solidarity we want, what kind of sisterhood we want. Non sisterhood with non, with non prostitutes? No. I have sisterhood with prostitutes in Iraq as well because they are forced into it. So many of them have been killed. Under Saddam's regime, there was a uh, Al Hamd al Imaniyah, Faith Women's Campaign. In one day, 200 women were beheaded for being so called prostitutes. So many of them were political. Their heads were hanged outside the window to make them an example to preserve more public morality. This is the same dictator I'm talking about. Now we have many more dictators. I don't even mention their names. We have a so-called parliament with so-called 25% of women quota, you name it. These women, they gathered and they said, honor killing is okay if the woman is in an illicit relationship. Why I do need this type of woman in parliament? I don't actually need them. You know, I have to expose them more than I expose men as well. 
So basically, we ended up with a forced Islamization of Iraq, and it is worrying. Both the Iraqi constitution and the Kurdish constitution have implemented Islamic Sharia law in one way or another. It is basically, now in, in the south, they have started with Islamization, closing down on uh, so many places, you know, from the day first they have started to do that. There's another thing I wanted to talk about is the women's movement, uh, our movements uh, in different countries and in our own countries as well. We need to be in real solidarity. And I'm coming to our on local level later on, but on international level, I do not want charity. I do not want women from, let's say, France, Britain, America to feel pity for me. No, I'm sorry, I'm not a victim. I hate the feeling of victimhood because it doesn't help. It's very nostalgic, I'm sorry, it doesn't help. I want the feeling of bravery, you know, activism, you know, being politically active to solve problems and to achieve equality between men and women and an egalitarian alternative for everybody in society because we cannot achieve equality under such regimes that we have at the moment in this region. I want equal solidarity, you know, sisterhood on the basis of that we are equal. In so many countries I have been to uh, giving talks, the way they talk to you, like, uh, as a, you know, from the point of supremacy, oh, do you have feminists in Iraq? Oh, I didn't know you have women like you and activists, and I'm, I'm sorry, you know? <laughs> Why are you, yeah, I was, yeah, so I, one day I was, um, being interviewed by a journalist and someone passed and came back, oh really, are you from Iraq? Oh, I thought everybody is under veil and burqas. You know, for me, I never wore the veil in my life. You know, my family were very secular actually. So many families were secular in, in Iraq and Iraqi Kurdistan. Religion did not play a big role. People ordinarily are Muslims. My mom is a Muslim, it was. But you know, it's, it was a private thing. It was not in everyday public life. But now, the social pressure made that so many Members of my family, women, are now veiled because they don't even believe in it, but they just wear it to go out. Basically, it's very important to feel equal to other movements in the world and not to actually accept solidarity on the basis of charity and pettiness. I hate that, basically. And about our own movement, we need to be a little bit politicized. I think sometimes we are ultra soft on our options for activism and we just think that we are waiting for men to analyze the world for us, to analyze the politics for us. No, I'm sorry, I don't give them space. I am here to, to, to know where is the oppression is and where it is coming from, its sources and the steps to actually fight for my own liberation and equality of others. And another problem is that the depoliticization of women's movement across the world you know, women are being turned into NGOs and charities and, uh, you know, structures of hierarchy, uh, director and uh, cleaner and this and that, and women comes to me as a victim. No, I think this is very degrading. The same power structure outside in the class-based society, unfortunately, we see it in our women organizations, is trying to, to symbolize itself. So I think we need to tackle that as well. We need to actually have a very, very strong politicized women's movement across Middle East and the world to be outspoken, to be against capitalism, against neoliberalism, against you know religious right. We have all these problems. We need to have answers for them. We cannot speak only about violence against women without taking into consideration the big powers behind our oppression. When I think of neoliberalism, the only things I can think about is privatization, war, supremacy, brutality, poverty, inequality, promotion of differences, and religiosity. I mean, these are just few things I can think of neoliberalism. I mean, I can see it everywhere it is happening. Religious right, you know, I mean, we have a very big problem with that in our laws, in our constitutions, and in our daily life. We need to tackle that. We need to be more vocal and more outspoken for women's rights and we have to make a distinction that religion is a private personal matter and politicizing religion is not allowed. Otherwise, I really think we all end up having something like Taliban. Talibanization is not far from Iraq and other countries as far as I'm aware. But I am happy that there are women's groups, there are 
uh, women uh, you know who are really outspoken out there in Iraq in Kurdistan you know I see so many wonderful women I have had the pleasure to meet so many of you because I didn't have the chance before to meet and to hear you and to listen to you and this type of conferences are a great opportunity for us to learn from each other's experiences and to be more open-minded and, and really to, to uh, come together for joint initiatives and to be more powerful and uh, represent the real progressive face of the Middle East. It's not the ugly face that is portrayed in the Western media for their own interest, but we have a beautiful face that is the egalitarian, the socialist, the women's movements that are being undermined by the Western media, biased media, I should say. And once again, I'm really happy to be here among you know, wonderful, great activists, and I am very much looking forward for future interactions and joint initiatives and I am based in London and I would be happy to support anyone whenever my help is needed and thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much and I thank you everyone because we are we're not supposed to, to point out specific persons yesterday, Lillian told us. Uh, I'm very <coughs> pleased that the breakfast meeting one year ago in Skopje ended up or started up this conference and uh, I think we all uh, should be uh, pleased that we can uh, continue the work with these issues. I will add to that that I'm a women's and peace activist since my youth. That's why I'm invited, I think. Uh, but I am also a professional social worker since uh, 20 years and I will uh, talk about it in my speech, my uh, work to, to connect the activism and the professional work. So I start now. And I have to read some of it. Uh, I will uh, start uh, to talk about my uh, work with refugees and migrant women uh, during the years. And I will start from my childhood. Uh, some years ago, I wrote an article uh, that I called War Zone in my own home. Uh, I think my engagement started already in my childhood, when I was a little girl, witness to violence against my mother. Several years later, I got involved in the women's movement and later on in politics. During the 90s, I helped refugees and paperless to hide, and I also helped them with juridical assistance or assessments, and I still do. I am since years convinced of the connection between state-supported violence, imperialist wars and religious fundamentalism, and violence in the very small society, as in the family. If the state support and encourage violence as conflict solutions, why should the individual citizen find another solution to their own antagonisms or conflicts? While the war machine built and constructed main part by men, why should a little boy find another role model than a soldier, unaware if it's in the home or in the battlefield? I'm a very proud mother of three sons. No one had done their military service. I hope I had some influence on their decisions. Uh, my work with migrant women in Sweden started already 20 years ago, and it's clear that my engagement in, in work against uh, violence for internationalism uh, had a big impact in this environment. It was obvious in my work, both on structural level and in individual cases, one case after another, that women's right to asylum and individual capacity or ability to decide were invisible in the process. Six years ago, I started to work with honor crimes in Sweden. And three years ago, I started an international work on women's rights in occupied and so-called post-conflict areas. These experiences have convinced me even more that women are invisible in the asylum process and always they, are connect, they connect the women either to their husbands or their children. So far, so far I have hardly ever uh, seen any case where the women uh, get asylum for her own sake. How can we tolerate this? 
we have an overwhelming problem in this world, a patriarchal structure where violence is used to oppress women and violence is defended as a so-called peacemaker uh, process and, or, or as a conflict solution. Most of the women I meet in the asylum process are threatened by gender-based violence if they will be sent back or are victims of gender-based violence during the war. When women need asylum to get asylum in Sweden or elsewhere, they are often forced to prostitute to get protection. Public shelters give seldom protection for asylum seeking or paperless, paperless women then they, the shelters can lose their economic support. These facts they hardly ever report. <clears throat> Women seeking for a better economic future are led to agree to marriage and find themselves abused and harassed and sent back when the man has used them for a couple of years and then decides to throw them out. The law in Sweden do not admit asylum if you divorce within two years marriage. However, in Sweden, if you are a victim of sex trafficking, you can seek for asylum. Which signals do these rules send to the society? If you are a victim of war crimes, rape, abuse and harassment, you can get asylum. But if the crimes connect to honor or sex crimes, it can be very hard for the woman to talk about them until a long time after their occurrence and then she can already have been sent back to the, an insecure future. In the in court, in the asylum process, I, my experience is, is that the, the interpreters often take the side of the perpetrators, either of uh, being naive or having prejudice, and they contradict the women's right to asylum in the court process. Women can also have reasons for right to asylum if they are victims of gender-based violence by the states, as in the dictatorships by religious fundamentalists, any religion. In addition, the women would, should be approved. Protection and asylum in the society is not able to protect their health or life. My work in Iraq, Kurdistan, since three years proves this. Post-conflict areas so-called post-conflict areas, are markets for sex trafficking. Prohibition on weapon export is needed. Recently, they discovered Swedish, Swedish we weapons handed over from the US forces to the National Guards in Iraq, even if we have prohibi prohibited weapon export to countries in armed conflicts, wars, or the US occupation is not seen as a war, this year, I have written six professional assessments to lawyers working with women seeking for asylum. I have used my professional knowledge about gender-based violence and included other related violence and hate crimes. Uh, I have used our legislation in Sweden and in international conventions, CEDO for example, in my assessments. Four of the cases have now got asylum one is denied, but I have advised them to complain to the European Court, and one is still waiting for the, her case to be decided by the Migration Court. I'm not very popular in the Migration Court, as you can understand. <laughs> and I also uh, want to thank Leila Halmane in one successful case. Thank you for your help. Yeah. Yes, it was successful. In Sweden, uh, we have a big problem with the kind of racism, even worse than racism in general. The kind of racism that silences people from criticizing oppression, the cultural relativism. It works like this. You blame people who question oppression by cultural symbols or attitudes for being racists. <laughs> then they do not dare to criticize. It can be when you, as a feminist, question symbols as burka and niqab. When you talk about unrelated violence and the problems with this specific kind of gender-based violence. The consequences for migrant women in Sweden, as well as in other European countries, are that the reasons for asylum are ignored in the name of cultural relativism. Part of the
the democratic society has capitulated and not least part of the left in Europe is no longer criticizing religions as an oppressing part uh, against women. The respect towards religion and re religious oppression against women are now superior CEDO and the declaration against violence against women. The conservative forces use these arguments in Christianity as well as in Judaism to protect and increase their oppression in the name of religion, using the fear of criticizing Islam. With this attitude, so-called Democrats and leftists protect patriarchy and sell out women's rights. This is a great danger and a threat in our common work for women's rights and peace. Women's rights are superior gender-based violence approved by the states or the family. I will end up promoting for a next conference focus, focusing on strategies, a strategy conference, how we will change the world. Thank you for listening.